Welcome. So, in 1975, my family decided to move to this area and to a small town called Overbrook, which was about a half an hour up the road from Ottawa. And in 1976, Roger Fredrickson, for whom the Fredrickson Chapel, he and his wife Ruth, is named in our programming, started a program called Adventures in Faith. And Adventures in Faith was to showcase specifically a team of alums, different alums, who had used the faith that they groomed and grew in their time here on campus and went out in the world and made an impact. And it happened every year. And interestingly enough, 11 years ago when I came here, I got to work with Roger, and one of the things I got to work with him on was Adventures in Faith. I remember because it involved community, it would get high school kids, and back in the 70s, I was one of those. It would bring us all together so that we could hear the stories of these people, fascinating stories of people, not all of them who were missionaries or pastors, many of them who'd gone into business or athletics, but who would let faith shape their lives in a way where they shaped their community, where they were the tangible hands and feet of God. So for years now, it has been what they call a convocation event. Many of you have joined us in the past. We have students and community, and they sit in the chapel, and we invite everybody in. And about five, six years ago, we started showing off some of our best students. They didn't even have to be graduated yet because we wanted our alums to see what our students were doing. And now we're in the midst of COVID. And some things were decided just this week by the American Baptist Central Region, by us, that maybe some of these events where we brought a ton of people together, even if we had our masks on, lost purpose if we somehow forced it too hard, if we pushed it too hard, when we had this cool video medium where we can share. Part of me is sort of sad because there's people that you will get to meet through this that I'm really proud to know, and I would like you to see them and talk to them and clap for them. But part of me is thrilled because this will cement a legacy for these people, a video legacy that they can show their kids and grandkids when we say that these people really are adventurers in faith. There are people who put their action where their mouth is. They put their deeds where their heart is. They work to do good in the world. They are not perfect people. They are not the saints that we read about. They're just like you and me. They're real. And they make God real in the lives of other people. So this year we are showcasing less alums and students because I wanted the world in video land, our friends in Arizona, in Wisconsin, in Kansas, as we share these things, to see students that are currently enrolled or that just graduated and to see how they're taking what they do and how they live and making a difference in the world. So <clears throat> I guess the last piece of background I should give you is through a generous grant, um, we were able to start something called the Fredrickson Ambassadors. The Fredrickson Ambassadors truly are people that we labeled and infused to be role models as far as tangible Christian faith. And this program through a generous grant from NetView allowed us to give a little stipend to people so that they could maybe take a little time from when they would work other jobs and actually go out and do tangible good things. Some of it scripted, like the food bank or the, the clothing bank. Some of it unscripted to say, check on your neighbor in case they're old and it's COVID, make sure they're okay. Help someone, visit with someone. And then the hard part, to find people that really fit that. At least in my world, I think God sent those people my way. I, I truly. I didn't have to go out and hustle to find those people. Those wonderful people came into my world, and I was going, wow, these are really good folk. I was proud to put the ambassador tag on them because they really are everything that Roger and Ruth Fredrickson would stand for, and they embody what we call the Ottawa spirit. So <clears throat> you get to meet Gabe again. Some of you through our chapel series remember that Gabe did a special project, a project that raised money to help with burial expenses for a good growing up friend of his. Gabe's not that old, and for him to come up with that idea and all the difficulty that goes with it shows the depth of who he is. You'll get to hear more from Gabe today. But I will tell you, and again, you never should have favorites, 
But at the end of the day, Gabriel's one of those people that when he comes into your office or to your world, just makes you feel good, makes you smile. He's real, he's genuine, means what he says, doesn't play a lot of politics. And there is a spark inside him that lets you know that you've met a good man. You just know it. He's one of those people that continually works to find things to do and to help. And if you can't find anything to do and help, he just chats with people to make them feel better. I think Gabe is hardwired that way. Now, the question is, when you meet people like Gabriel, is were they always hardwired that way? Were they just born to be perky little people that brighten everybody's day? And I would tell you most of the time, I don't think it works that way. I think that people grow sort of like trees into the kind of people that shade and shelter, that, that caused the shadows to, to be dissipated or to help shelter people from the harshness of the world. And I don't think it's always easy. That's what we would call a Fredrickson ambassador. That's what we would call, what Roger would call, an adventurer in faith. So, I'm going to let you hear from Gabe on how his journey started and sort of where he thinks his journey is going to take him. I do think, and Gabriel is the only student you will hear, current student, everybody else within our staff has graduated, <clears throat> but I think that it's a situation that as far as our faith ambassadors, this is a name that I want you to hear and look for because I feel strongly that Gabriel will do great things in the world. Mm, starting maybe while he's here, but certainly once he graduates. Again, thank you for being with us and welcome. I hope that you enjoy meeting these people as much as I've enjoyed getting to work with them all the time. Well, it was actually pretty wild because I used to live in a rough area, but like all rough areas, that area has hope in it. And I love that little area with all my heart. And growing up in Chattanooga, well, you know, you got different types of people. You got people who has who who has it out for you, or you have people that's with, with you at the end. Because you have you have all types of different people that like different incomes, different passions, different motives. Like that'll help you shape you into the person you are. Like from that area, like it helped me to show that like there's enough jerks or enough angry people in the world. But you need like good people to help counter that or balance that out. So I want to become one of those good people that help that community out. My mom, she was a really hard worker, and my grandma, she was full of love. So, like every time I come home from a rough day of school or whatnot, my mom or my grandma, she was like, maybe feel bad, but the world's not really like that. You can actually change it if you can. Like surround yourself with good people, and you know, good will come to you. And my grandma, she was, a, like I said, a really loving woman, and she would just, like, whatever happens, like, she would be there to support me either way. Anything anything that would happen, she would just be like, hey, it's going to be okay. Next day it's going to come, it's going to be better. But after my sophomore year in college, uh, there was a lot of stuff that was going on, like my mom passing away, and I didn't know what I wanted to do after that. So I was working at this camp, like, was, I was a camp counselor, so working with five and six year olds and um, you know, Kobe I had all different colleges trying to get at me at first, like Life University or Cumberland University or Dane or Doan and Auto University. And Kobe was the one that's been consistent in talking to me, said, Hey, uh, what do you wanna do? And I told him I'm not sure. I'm just I'm still trying to play it out by ear. And like I said, I didn't know what I wanna do with my life, so I'm just deep thought right now, and you know, I went home, prayed about it, and I was looking at all my trophies and medals, and I remember I saw my mom uh, a picture of me when me and my mom wanted to stay t when I wanted to stay championship, and she always told me like just like she said just go away where you feel most comfortable at, and Kansas is where I felt where I felt most where I felt most where I felt most comfortable at, and you know, I called Kobe back up. I think it was around four in the afternoon. I was like, hey, I'm in, no questions asked. So I signed my papers and I transferred to Ottawa University. And around this time, I was kind of like in a shell at first because I didn't know anybody because, you know, coming up from a, a rough area to a community college to a university, you just don't know what you're gonna get. So you just, I'm just basically in the shell. But here in Ottawa, trust is like, it's the number one thing. Like, trust, like, trust your advisors, trust your teachers, trust your coaches. Trust your bosses, like I, it's filled. It's filled with that here, 
And what I want to do when I graduate, I want to take some of that stuff here and like bring it back and like build that trust and build like I want to know. Like I want the community like no, it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to like like ask for um for a job or it's okay to like trust one another. Because, you know, building trust, like, from here, it's, like, easy. But building trust in my area, like, for my community, it's kind of hard. And what I want to do is I want to introduce wrestling to the community. Like, my my major is sports studies, and I would love to be a director at one of those rec centers and introduce wrestling to the community and build a safe family, fun environment. Because if a kid if a kid can see what you're doing, like doing the right thing, that kid's gonna try to follow you. Be like, okay, if he's doing the right thing, he got he got it together. So I'm gonna follow him, and hopefully, I wanna build that. I wanna build that trust between people. That like they see, okay, he's doing it, and he's doing well for himself. Maybe we should take pick, pick up some tips from him. See like what we can do. So, so yeah, because you, you never know who's watching. If that makes sense, you absolutely don't never know who's watching, because you can help a. Help a person across the street, they're like, okay, that dude's a good person. Maybe if I see somebody like that, I'm going to do the same thing. Maybe he's not around. <laughs> kind of like a superhero type deal. <laughs> like you see him do it, I say, okay, you want to be like him. I want to be like him. I want to try to I want to try to be like him by doing good things in the um, community. Like how I roll, like nothing really surprises me anymore. It's just I just go with the flow. It's just, like You ever heard that term, uh, don't walk by sight, walk by faith? That's basically what I do. Pretty much everything God is basically intended to do when I first got here, because He God knew what He was doing when He when He signed me when I signed here. Uh, I'm gonna be surrounded by all good people and who want nothing but the best for me. Well, that community is a part of me, and I'm a part of that community. If you believe in your community, then they will believe in you. So the next person you will meet was my very first faith ambassador, William. <clears throat> and I met him, well, I, guess, I, I, I think I actually met him when he was applying to come to OU, and I was on a panel, and, and he presented. But most of my work with him was through football. And at that time, I was doing a program called Finishing School with my good friend Donald Anderson. And that program was a program to sort of help everybody mm, become a little more savvy in the ways of the world. What I mean by that is there's a lot of stuff that maybe you haven't heard of when you first start college. Have you ever played chess? Well, if you haven't and somebody talks about how a pawn moves, do you know how they move? We do a thing where we have a dinner, and that dinner teaches folk which fork and spoon and things to use so if they're at a really fancy dinner or for a wedding, they know. We have people make toasts like they might have to do for a wedding someday. We want to make sure that once people graduate, if they weren't exposed to some of this earlier, there's nothing that sort of throws them for a loop when people say, make a toast at this wedding, you're the best man, and you go, a toast? We have people write a prayer so that they understand when someone says, now so-and-so will stand up and give a prayer, that it's okay. You can script it, you can do it. And Will was one of those people that stood out as a player in finishing school and a person that Donald and I were able to use to help sort of herd cats and do all sorts of stuff. He was very engaged in FCA, which is Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Um, he was very engaged. He ended up being engaged in theater. I got to direct him in several shows, which was pretty neat, and he was good. He was engaged in helping with the food bank and the clothing bank with a lot of the things that we did to help through campus ministries. He was very helpful with my chapels. He just was one of those people that naturally stepped in to where we had some pretty big needs. Now, I have to say, and this is what always happens, you get these students you really think are amazing and then they graduate. So, is it different not to have Will around? Yeah, I mean, in so many ways, Will was one of those people when I needed something, I, I felt that I could always call him and you get used to that. Um, but you also know that those people are going to go out in the world and make a big difference. So, so now you get to hear from Will in his world where he's starting to make a big difference. He's actually enrolled in another institution as he works on his master's degree. He's making a difference where he is now because that's how he's built. And I miss him. We miss him. But he is definitely an adventurer in faith. And I want you to hear his story, to hear not just what led him to OU, but how he was shaped by faith and shaped faith here at OU, and what he's planning to do about it in a world which, frankly, could use a little bit of help. 
So enjoy getting to know Will. And again, look for him because I think his name's William Wallace, and I'm sure he gets lots of grief on that. But you will see great things done by him in the future. Yeah, so I uh, finished my undergraduate only about three months ago, um, for those who are going to see this but don't know. And um, I have been trying really hard to get plugged into the new area that I moved into, uh, Hayes, Kansas. And what I've been working on really is trying to get plugged into this church that I'm going to. And they're very kind, very welcoming people. And how that's looking for me right now is um, be going to these community events and then also like volunteering when I can to show up early, help set up and stuff. So if you're ever looking for a way to get plugged into something, service is the way to go. People love it when you are there to to help them, to aid them, but also like give them a little bit of guidance too. So my dad has always been just a man of service. Um, he, uh, we, we've been going to the same church when I was growing up for like nearly a decade. And uh, he was a, he was serving as an elder uh, during that time. And, you know, we would be there anytime we can. We actually spent a good, I would say, 70 percent of our weekends of a year back in the back in about 2006, helping our church congregation actually build a new uh, chapel for us to meet in. So that's really when I kind of saw like there's there's service in the day to day, but there's also service that needs to be done. That's really kind of manual work. And then. Uh, we ended up moving away from that congregation uh, out to uh, a little church in Strasburg, Colorado, and my dad got plugged into the elder team there as well. And, and once again, we're, we're there whenever we can, uh, just building community, building friendships, uh, trying to spread the word, you know, um, by hosting some of these events at our house. And I think just watching my dad get plugged in and, and the, the community he has and the relationship he has with these people is just really inspiring for me. So I've seen the fulfillment in community that my dad has had from this but i've also seen that this this service that he's done especially within the church but to people outside of the church um you know just helping people out when he can neighbors move it's it's kind of given me this idea that when it comes to personal fulfillment this is the way to really build deep relationship <clears throat> sorry uh trusting relationship but then also to to work on your faith as well. When you, you take a step back from yourself, from what you're doing and help another person achieve their goals or what they're working on, you can kind of see that, um, you know, you're, you're not the, you're not the center of the world, you know, obviously Jesus loves you and, and you know, you're God's son, but at the same time, uh, everyone is too. It's something I've been trying to make myself more aware of. It's very easy to, uh, especially nowadays, just put your headphones in and listen to music and get what work you got to get done. But at the same time, it, everyone's doing the same thing. So why not, you know, band together and work towards the same goal? Um, that's what I've been realizing more and more lately. So working through school right now, I've also taken a part-time job at a local gas station um, right off Interstate 70. So we get a very wide variety of people coming through there. Um, people with wide beliefs, you know, different skin tone, different backgrounds, people who can hardly speak, you know, the lingua franca, if I, if you, I could say that. But, and I found that the best way to get somebody to just be open and willing to talk to you and have a decent conversation is just to say, sir, ma'am, how may I help you today? Um, it doesn't matter who they are, as long as you approach it very respectful and like, with like a very serving heart, they are very open to having a conversation with you. And when it's 2.30 in the morning uh, and someone finds themselves at a gas station, most of the time, all they want is a conversation. So um, that's what I've definitely been finding lately is like just being super polite and open and trying not to judge right off the bat why someone is coming into your store early in the morning. Um, just I, I just respect is the, uh, the best way to gain any kind of trust, even if it's a fleeting conversation at a gas station. So honestly, be able to get up every day and and look at people in a way that they 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 mean more than to just another individual around me you know um like i i definitely had this this reoccurring customer who's coming in occasionally and first time he came in i wouldn't even talk to me wouldn't even make eye contact he'd just kind of grunt to things that he was interested in wanting and eventually by being polite, by being respectful, and by giving that serving heart, he'll come in for 10, 15 minutes a day now. Now, granted, it is two in the morning while we're having this conversation, but he'll just he'll just talk to me about how things are going in his life. Um, 
you know, and any ways that I could potentially help him. Um, and I think that's, that's why it's important. It's because people are isolated. People are lonely and just being willing to be open and friendly is the best way to break that barrier down. So, and I think the most important reason for that is you can always, you're able to find people who are in need when you're doing that. I've met um, a lot of people who, who come in and um, you can tell that they're, they're worn down, they're, they're tired, they're, they're struggling financially, however uh, it might work out. And I, I do the best I can as a grocery store clerk while also holding the ideals of the business, you know, um, to, to assist them however I can. But uh, a lot of the need that we are seeing nowadays is less, less physical need. Um, we're, we're living in a country where, where hunger and, and poverty do exist, and we, we kind of tend to sweep that under the rug a lot, but there are a lot of resources available. What we're seeing a lot is just the need for people to, to feel loved and, and connected and confident in themselves. Um, like I, I had a, currently, this is very recent in my life, I, this gas station we're working for, we are doing a, a drive also for the local food bank, and I asked if he'd like to make a contribution and, and the first thing he said to me was, uh, no, I'll never do that. The food bank's never done anything for me anyways. And I, and, you know, I, I wanted to be super respectful and reply. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure if you just took that time to make that connection or, or to go in there, you would find, you'd find great people. You'd find that they're not so isolating. They're not so judgmental towards you. And they, they'd be willing to help you any way they can. So while the resources are out there, What's missing are people who are willing and able to make that connection and make that friendship and, and treat people respectfully. When you're first making a connection to someone who, who you think is, is kind of out there, kind of lonely, in need of a friend, in need of a helping hand, it, it takes a lot of, of talking on your part to kind of warm them up a little bit, nudge that. Um, once again, going back to trust, being respectful. Um, but then eventually, once you finally get them able to be willing to talk with you, then it is time to be quiet and listen and, and have that conversation. Obviously not let your own ideals get, get bullied around or kicked around or however, but also be willing to, to listen to what their need is or, or how there's any way you can help them. That's what really, you know, faith and religion is, is we're, we're not all man. We are also children of God as well. Um, while we're working through this. And so I, I, you know, when it comes to this kind of conversation about what your faith means to you, it is about making it rather personal and then showing them how it's changed your life and potential ways that it could uh, impact theirs. If they were to take that same step, it's not necessarily, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to call you an unbeliever or a heretic for not believing what I believe, but at the same time, when you, when you open up and, and start talking about this, you need to be uh, willing to do it with grace. I, I, see, I see charity um, a lot of the time. I, I see people who, are, who have the heart to, to give, but not to serve, if that makes any sense to you. I see a lot of individuals who are um, you know, willing to toss a few cents towards uh, a charity in the area or to a region or whatever, but when it comes to like actual grace, um, I see a lot of, of frustration when people get let down. Um, I see a little bit of anger also I'll, when, when someone's needs or someone requires something of another individual and, and uh, they get let down, there's, a, there's not a lot of patience. There's a lot of um, anger and frustration. And then, like I said, not a lot of willing to serve in a lot of regards as well. The way that I, I, I think about it is to, to almost take a step back and look introspectively and to say like, I, I, I know that this is what I believe in my heart. Um, and, and I know that this is what the Bible has to tell me. And this is how this relates to my daily life. It's, it's the understanding of those things. But when it comes to hardening the heart towards your fellow man, that, that can be just as damning uh, when it comes to the, uh, the process of, of spreading faith. You know, if, if all of a sudden, I disagree with this individual and I get this kind of, I, I would hate to say, use the term, but Christian anger or Christian wrath uh, to the point to where I refuse to speak to them. All of a sudden, what I'm doing is I'm taking my role as an ambassador for Christ and turning it into a, a guard for Christ or 
a, uh, a roadblock for Christ when instead I should be a, uh, a servant, a, a greeter, an ambassador, if that makes sense. When it comes to actually seeing every individual that I come across as equally deserving of, of God's grace and, and Jesus's gift of life, that's when it gets very difficult, especially when I, I someone crosses my path in a way that I'm not necessarily uh, pleased about. You know, I, I try to be friendly with everyone, but everyone has a few people that they wouldn't necessarily call friend. Um, but at the end of the day, you need to you need to reconcile this idea that, you know, Jesus didn't just die for me. He died for everybody. And that's a very difficult thing to do. It goes against our our human side to succeed or to to rise above everyone else yes you know and the most difficult part of it is is admitting your own fault and your own sin to the point to where you you look at yourself and you say yeah truly you know even though i am the son of god i am also a man you know and every man is deserving of this none of us are deserving of the grace that Jesus has given us, but we all do receive that gift openly. And that's not always easy to see working towards service or, or any kind of um, development that you can have when it comes to identifying people who are in need or, or identifying people as people in general is to just, like I said earlier, to begin with, just absolutely be respectful in all cases. Try not to pass judgment without understanding another pe person's situation. And then all of a sudden, they don't become uh, just another face that you saw that day. They become someone who has a little bit of a backstory. And um, I, I don't do that in all cases. And, you know, obviously, no one can. Um, but that, that's the easiest part is to to look at another person and say, yeah, they're, they're, they're struggling through the same things that I am. Um, why, why don't I try to pass on a little bit of grace?